Hello and welcome to today's webinar on migrations from New England to and through New York. My name is Ginevra Morse. I'm the Vice President of Education and Programming here at American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be your moderator for today's session. This program is brought to you by the Brew Family Learning Center. American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history, and we're pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. Our presenter today is Senior Genealogist of the Newbury Street Press, Kyle Hurst. Kyle holds a BA in both History and Anthropology from the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and a Master's Certificate in Museum Studies from Tufts University. After two years as a volunteer, Kyle joined American Ancestors in 2008. For several years, a member of the Research Services team, she focuses on research in the Mid-Atlantic, Midwest, New England, and various European countries. She's the author of several genealogies, including Ancestors and Descendants of Charles Le Caron and Victoire Sprague, which won the 2020 National Genealogical Society Award for Excellence in Genealogy and Family History. Now, New York has been called the first West for New England because so many New Englanders settled there before continuing westward. So understanding patterns of settlement, expansion, and migration can help identify your ancestors' deep New England roots. In the next hour or so, we'll look at the historical context, the records, and some research strategies for tracing ancestors on the move in the Northeast. At any point during the presentation, feel free to type your question into the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. Screen. We'll address those at the end. There is a syllabus for this session that can be purchased from our online bookstore. You'll find a link to this downloadable PDF in your reminder emails, and we'll also include that link in our follow-up email after today's broadcast. We are recording this event, and starting later today, you can freely go back and review any of the content from the presentation on our website, as well as our YouTube channel. So if you missed something on today's first listen, not to worry, you can always review the presentation later. All right, so without further ado, I know we have a lot to get through, so I'll turn things over to Kyle. Thank you, Ginevra. So to talk about migrations from New England to and through New York, let's start right off with a visual of just how many New Englanders we're dealing with. All of these dots represent New England settlements in New York. The bigger the dot, the more New Englanders are in that area. So the largest groups are areas that are 91 to 100 percent made up of New Englanders, while even the smallest still have 11 to 20 percent. So this is why New York has been called the first West for New England. And we think of New York's frontier as an extension of New England or even greater New England. In the early 1820s, one Yale president even called New York a colony from New England. So to understand what happened, we need to go all the way back to the beginning of the English colonies within New England. Now, obviously we can't cover two centuries of settlement history here and now, but we can mention a few highlights of New England geography, settlement and migration in order to lay the foundation for that settlement. We're talking here about the settlement of the first communities by immigrants from England, but also the settlements of new communities by those who are already in New England. So we're talking about internal New England migration as a method of settlement. The original boundaries claimed as English colonies were broad. Uh, New England Council was given full power over the judgments and distributions of land from the 40th to the 48th parallel. And by 1622, two additional large grants established um, more area up in northern New England. So today's New England was formed primarily out of these eight colonies, though there are there were some smaller settlements that didn't last. So this is just to give you an idea of the settlement dates, and they're all happening within what we consider the Great Migration between 1620 and 1640. From 1620 to 1635, New England was first settled along the coast from Plymouth up into modern New Hampshire with Portsmouth, Dover, and even Maine, uh, Saco, and Portland. So we begin in the south and branch up northward. And towns are being settled in pursuit of good water and farming. They're only going to establish a church after it seemed like a town would succeed or if that town is too distant from a former church. 
religious motivations had prompted many of the migrations from England, uh, thinking of the Puritans, the pilgrims. And starting about 1635, that's going to factor into the establishment of new colonies, like when Roger Williams and Anne Hutchinson go off to start Rhode Island. Um, congregations are driven to split and set up new churches elsewhere, like when Reverend Thomas Hooker leaves Cambridge, Massachusetts for Hartford, Connecticut. Settlers are pushing into the interior. They're increasingly looking for more lands for farming, and they're usually basing around rivers like the Connecticut. And eventually, we're going to see more going into the northern inland. So by the end of this initial settlement period, really, we're talking about the largest populations being in Massachusetts and Connecticut. Let's take a brief tour through New England to see how the colonies came to be, to merge, and then how their colonists established new colonies. When talking about Southern New England, we're looking at six primary colonies, two each for modern day Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. The two Massachusetts colonies, Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay, were settled in the 1620s. In the mid 1630s, religious dissidents from the overcrowded Massachusetts Bay then branched out to form the two Rhode Island and Connecticut colonies. Rhode Island pretty much became one colony in 1643 and was filled in by still more religious dissidents like Quakers. So their colonists are going to migrate off into Connecticut, Plymouth, Western Massachusetts, and much later further into central New York. Connecticut's two main colonies were rivals, having been settled by Puritans for opposite reasons. Connecticut because the churches were too strict and New Haven because churches weren't strict enough. And the two finally agreed to merge in 1665. With access to the Connecticut River, settlers are branching out northward to settle in Western Massachusetts and later up into Western and Eastern Vermont. Both Connecticut colonies sent colonists across Long Island Sound to settle the island uh, between the towns that had already been established by Massachusetts Bay colonists. From there, large waves from places like Fairfield and Litchfield counties in Connecticut are going to continue on into Dutchess, Westchester, and Orange counties in New York. And later in the 1740s, we're going to see a rise in migration from the former Plymouth colony even into Putnam County, New York. And I wanna give you a visual of these colonies, which we can see on these map images. Note especially the overlapping boundaries here as they're gonna have a big impact on the settlement and migration into New York. See how Massachusetts Bay stretches west through today's New York and spreads north into today's Maine. Connecticut claimed Long Island, which was just one of the issues between Connecticut and New York, while border issues arose between Connecticut and Massachusetts and Massachusetts and New Hampshire, and oh, the troubles that the border issues between New Hampshire and New York sparked. Northern New England was quite different from the Southern New England colonies that populated it. Its remote mountainous landscape with few east to west roads made it less accessible with poor farming conditions, not to mention it was vulnerable uh, being out there on the frontier. As we can see from the 1738 map, all of the areas in light green, that's Massachusetts Bay and Plymouth, but also the province of Maine, as it's called here, they were included in the Massachusetts Charter of 1691. Maine was absorbed by Massachusetts Bay in 1677 and never released until it became its own state in 1820 as part of the Missouri Compromise. So it did have some coastal settlements as early as the 1620s, but they really had to retreat during King Philip's War in the 1670s and didn't really recover and keep growing until the mid 1700s. So still most of the interior of Maine wasn't settled until the early 1800s when we're gonna see Eastern New Englanders choosing to go there instead of New York. Now, the 1738 map also shows that not much headway has been made into the interior of New Hampshire, only about 60 miles, despite having had settlements as early as 1623. Now, New Hampshire had also at one time fallen under Massachusetts Bay jurisdiction, so it was mostly settled by folks from that colony. And it took another century until 1719 through the 1760s for the population to really grow significantly, most of the settlement settlers still coming out of other New England areas. And the remainder of this area on the 1738 map was claimed as belonging to the crown of Great Britain, but as yet not granted away. Vermont actually started off as New Hampshire's interior from the 1740s to the 1760s, 
And most settlers are coming up the Connecticut River from Western Massachusetts. Um, but also we're seeing the western side of the Green Mountains filling with settlers from Litchfield County, Connecticut. We're seeing areas to the east of the mountains being heavily populated by Connecticut's Tolland and Wyndham counties. And in 1765, that's when New York is given jurisdiction over the area that became Vermont and eventually creates three New York counties out of that territory. So unsurprisingly, much of Vermont was settled by New Yorkers. Uh, like, for example, Burlington was heavily settled by folks from Dutchess County. And remember, too, that many of the areas in New York that are moving into Vermont were first settled by those from Connecticut, which again was settled by those from Massachusetts Bay. So it's all connected here. Now, these maps come from Lois Matthews expansion of New England, and they show the growth of New England up until New Englanders really started heading to New York in the large wave. Note how King Philip's War pulled back settlers from Maine and Western Massachusetts, those frontiers, but New England made a comeback and started filling in the interior. By 1781, just before the big exodus to New York, see how all of Southern New England and most of New Hampshire and Southern Vermont are already being settled there. So then, now what, what about New York settlement? Well, you may have noticed on those maps that Long Island was included on New England maps and it really was considered part of New England. And as we can see on this map marked in one and two, the earliest settlements there, uh, English settlements, I should say, were located on either end of the island and they were settled by Massachusetts colonies. The North Shore of Long Island was mostly settled by former residents of Connecticut who'd crossed the Sound. And then we have Dutch in the West End. The English towns were independent until 1662 when they united with the Connecticut colonies. Now, the other front of early settlement in New York was up the Hudson River Valley. The Dutch had discovered the Hudson River in 1609, and New Netherland had been established back in 1624 with Fort Orange, that's today's Albany, and going down to New Amsterdam, which is today's New York City. After the English took over in 1664, renaming the colony New York, we're gonna see more New Englanders moving into that area. And we can see that going up the east side of the river on this map with numbers four, that's Bedford and Rye, and six, the Beekman Patton in Dutchess County, and five, the Oblong, which was a contested strip on the border. Um, and Long Island then becomes a natural jumping off point to get to those areas, to get to Westchester and Dutchess County, especially in the 1740s. And that becomes by far the largest wave of emigration out of New England by that time. The settling of lands within the current boundaries of New York partly arose due to conflicting land claims. Again, that the charter, once it was granted to the Duke of York in 1664, overlapped places already claimed by foreign governments, the New England Council, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and even the Virginia Company. What we really need to keep in mind here is that Massachusetts and Connecticut lacked firm Western boundaries. So New York had to work out disputes over where those borders would be. Although attempts dated back to 1683, it wasn't really until 1731 that Connecticut ceded that oblong, the strip of land east of the Hudson River. Massachusetts border was confirmed in 1767 at 20 miles east of the Hudson River. And settlers who didn't want to remain tenants under the New York system moved on from there, some of them to Vermont. Now, Massachusetts still had a claim to an area that became Western New York. There's 6 million acres of land west of a 1763 proclamation line that's called the Massachusetts Reserve, and over 200,000 acres between Oswego and Chenango Rivers called the Massachusetts or Boston 10 Towns. The 1786 Treaty of Hartford gave Massachusetts the right to sell the land but let New York keep jurisdiction. Now, based on the idea that New York's eastern border extended only 20 miles east of the Hudson River, New Hampshire originally claimed lands that um, between that point and the Connecticut River. In 1765, again, we have England setting New York's border instead at the Connecticut River, and that's how you have conflicting claims between New Hampshire and New York over what later became uh, they start calling themselves Vermont in 1777, but New York didn't agree to terms until 1791 when Vermont was admitted as a state. So really, 
The first New Englanders in New York, it's more a matter of settlement based on land claims rather than migration from New England to New York. And we also have the reverse with Yorkers buying lands in Vermont during New York's claim to the territory in conflict with New Hampshire's claims. Now that we have a sense of how New England filled in and the initial settlements of New York, let's explore how New Englanders migrated into New York. What motivated these New Englanders to move there? With migrations, we always want to think in terms of push and pull, things that push the person to migrate away from a residence and those that pull them to move to a specific new area. And unsurprisingly, those go hand in hand because often what you don't like about one place is what you're trying to improve in the next. Land was far and away the prime motivation for most of these migrants. As New England filled in, less land was available. What was available was worn out due to overcultivation or poor farming ground. They even had to pay higher taxes. During the American Revolution, marches through New York State revealed bountiful lands, and veterans returned home to encourage others to join them in snapping it up. So mostly, New Englanders are looking for good and cheap land in New York, and tradesmen are also interested in the plentiful timber that's over there. And they were able to reach this land thanks to New York's advances in transportation. Roads and eventually canals and railroads provided access and made transporting goods profitable. Whereas New England was feeling too crowded to offer enough opportunity and employment. Even though most of New England didn't practice primogeniture, which is where the oldest son gets the land, uh, in large families, younger sons still lacked opportunities to support themselves and their families. Whereas New York offered emerging industries in places like Troy and Utica, even New York City, they had growing business prospects that New Englanders could take advantage of. Beyond economics, we've already noted how much of uh, New England was formed due to religious disputes, so that's nothing new. They wanted the chance to set up community according to their own principles instead of continuing to follow those in charge. But the discontentment went even beyond religious to social and political as well. On the frontiers of New York, the New Englanders faced less governmental and societal oversight and had more chances for self-determination. And this imbued those frontiersmen with the spirit of liberty that paved the way to the revolution. So all of these opportunities for work, land, transportation, self-determination, the potential pioneers learned about them through advertising campaigns from other New Englanders who had made the move themselves, or especially those who were speculating in land sales for the new regions. Now, migration patterns emerged along the same lines as the settlement patterns we mentioned earlier. Primarily, we're dealing with a saltwater society that settled along the coast and then moved inland. Being that we're talking about the East Coast, moving to the interior meant moving west, usually along parallel lines of latitude which makes sense. It's based on accessibility. Of course, Northern New England is going to have an easier time getting to Northern New York. And along the same lines, they're gonna choose areas along waterways and established paths, which were easier to reach. River banks were prime locations to set up towns because settlers could travel and transport goods by boat and even establish mills. And people tended to move from populated areas to less densely settled areas. Again, this had to do with wanting more land fewer restrictions. However, of course, being more isolated means being more vulnerable. Relations between settlers and natives definitely played a role in determining the frontier. Violent interactions often resulted in settlements being abandoned or at least temporarily as settlers were grouped closer together for protection. But on the other hand, working with the tribes could open up options to settlers, like missionaries to the Iroquois when they sent back word to New England about lands available in what became New York. So yes, relations with the native tribes both closed off and opened up settlement opportunities. The end of the French and Indian War in 1763 established the line shown on these two maps. They divided the colonists from what they called the Indian Reserve to the west and forbade that they acquire Indian lands west of that line. And that posed such a barrier to migration that it was a contributing factor leading up to the revolution. Iroquois had hindered New York expansion, but when they were left hanging after that war, they negotiated their own treaty in 1784, giving New York swaths of land. However, colonial mag era migration is mostly constrained by topography, the landscape. 
pioneers needed accessibility. And as we can see from this topographical map, New England and New York both have mountainous regions. The Appalachian mountain chain made for a long natural barrier with few natural breaks. But those breaks, that big, huge break we're seeing is the Hudson River and its valley. That becomes the major north-south route. And New York's Hudson River Valley, of course, had Berkshires to the east and Catskills and Adirondacks to the west. So the only natural westward outlet was the Mohawk River and its valley. And as we can see from these migration maps, the Albany area became a jumping off point and the Mohawk River Valley was the way west in New York. So transportation options along that path kept improving. We go from the Mohawk Trail to a horse path, to a wagon trail, to the Mohawk Turnpike in the early 1800s, to the Erie Canal, which was finished in 1825, to the New York Central Railroad, to even the New York Thruway today. And we're viewing these major routes out of New England into New York State per William Dollarhide's Map Guide to American Migration Routes. And we can see just from that example how many transportation improvements allowed New York's population to grow. The growing of roads and canals greatly reduced travel times from point A to point B. And the transportation expenses, which not only made it easier for our ancestors to relocate, but also for them to move goods at better prices. When you look at where your ancestor ended up, check for routes that would help them get there. This may even help fill in gaps if they stopped along the way. Family Search has a wiki page for New York Turnpikes that links to more information on specific routes and uh, maps like this handy reference map, which shows in blue the two major canals, the Champlain in light blue and Erie in dark blue. As we can see, the Erie Canal provided easy access across New York to the Great Lakes. So by that point, Point when it was finished, one could travel from Vermont to the Midwest entirely by water, and the transportation was cheap while still running frequently and regularly. We've talked about how and why, so at this point it might be helpful to consider when, by looking at a timeline of New England expansion as it led to them spreading out into New York. Broadly speaking, the period from 1660 to the American Revolution saw colonists expanding out from the earliest New England settlements into the rest of New England and Eastern New York. And we can break this vast era into four time spans. But really the key to keep in mind is that conflict hindered expansion. So that's what we see from 1660 to 1713. New England still fairly scattered with isolated settlements that kept having to retreat due to frequent attacks and a series of wars. But still we're gonna see the settlement of Long Island. Then from 1713 to 1744, uh, it was comparatively peaceful times, so colonists left their crowded settlements looking for those new frontiers to the west and to the north so they could expand trade and commerce and, of course, find that land. So mostly here we're going to have movements along New York's borders with Massachusetts and Connecticut, and they're working up between those conflicted areas to the east and the Hudson River to the west. And uh, then from 1754 to 1763, we have the French and Indian War, which meant very little expansion. But even before it officially ended with the Treaty of Paris in 1763, the earliest years of the 1760s saw lots of New Hampshire town grants in Vermont. And right over the border in Washington County, New York, were several patents like the Turner Patent, granting 25,000 acres to a group from Pella, Massachusetts. Then 1763 to 1780s, we have the initial expansion into northern New England uh, before the revolution slows down the migration. But by 1770, we're really seeing that all the best lands in the southern New England colonies, lower Maine, New Hampshire, even pushing into Vermont, um, that's all getting filled up. And so the overflow is heading to Long Island and the Hudson River. But we're also seeing tracks along the Mohawk um, and grants to veterans around Lake George and Lake Champlain. But think about this, by the late 1780s, New York population is still smaller than Massachusetts and Connecticut. It's the seventh of 13 states. Its frontier, as described in Yankees and Yorkers, stretched from Lake Champlain across the Hudson 
and the upper reaches of the Mohawk down to the valley of the Susquehanna. And then after 1781, we're going to see the greatest migration outside of New England to New York. So that brings us to the height of New Englanders moving into New York, the period from 1783 to 1820. Statistically, looking at census numbers, between 1790 and 1825, New York's population at least tripled. And it's estimated that between 60 to 67% of that increase came out of New England. So a lot of that has to do with the removal of those English acts from that treaty in 1763. And remember all those colonies had those overlapping titles. So removing those really gave us a real rush of pioneering to the North and the far West. And as we can see from the first map here from uh, 1790, we already have New Englanders uh, populating older towns along the Hudson River up into the, the shores of Lake Champlain. But really, as we see by 1820, the best opportunities are going to come out of central and western New York, mostly through the Mohawk Valley to the upper part of Genesee country, emerging at Buffalo around uh, 1800. Now, what caused that influx of New Englanders into New York? The biggest draw was land. After the revolution, New York opened up various areas beyond the former frontier. With the end of the war, the New York's new state uh, set about negotiating and purchasing land from the native tribes to make room for new settlers. So without that royal proclamation of 1763, we're going to see federal and state treaties with the Iroquois open up central and western New York. We see the first reservations in New York marked in stars here. That's in 1788 and 1797. And surrounding those two reservations was the military tract, about 1.8 million acres in the center of the state that was originally set aside by New York as bounty land for soldiers. Just east of that military tract, shown here in the red triangle, was the Chenango 20 townships also known as Clinton's Purchase because Governor George Clinton negotiated for the territory to be released by the Oneidas in 1788. You can see it's right below their reservation. And then we have circled in red here below the military track, the Boston 10 towns. So remember again, that Hartford Conference of 1786 gave Massachusetts the right to sell property there. Now, Western and Northern New York opened up things to still more land purchases. Here's where we see the rise of speculative land companies, which made purchasing land easier. The Western three here all stem from the 6 million acres of the Massachusetts Reserve, the other area of that Hartford Treaty of 1786. So again, Massachusetts has permission to sell, New York governs. And so we first see uh, Massachusetts contracting in 1788 with Oliver Phelps and Nathaniel Gorham. And then they sell in 1790, the part just to the west of them to Robert Morris. And then once he had rights, Morris ended up selling the Western 3.3 million acres to the Dutch banking houses that formed the Holland Land Company, who then surveyed and sold off to individuals between 1801 and 1840. So over two thirds of those living in this Western part of New York were originally from Southern New England. And finally to the North was McComb's Purchase, which uh, was, given out in 1791, it's almost 3.7 million acres, about an eighth of New York state. And as we'll see, this area became especially popular for Vermont, but also some New Hampshire and Massachusetts. So what we have is by the 19th century, New England's pretty much settled and people are more likely to move into urban areas looking for work, leaving rural Northern New England areas for urban areas in Southern New England and over in New York especially through 1820, but even beyond, Yankees moved westward into and through New York. And as the century progressed, they tended to migrate through New York to reach Western territories and states, but they're also creating boom towns along the way with rising industries in places like Utica, Rochester, and Buffalo. Meanwhile, immigrants from Ireland, Italy, further east in Europe, they're coming over to work in the factories and they're filling in the areas that the New Englanders have left behind as they move into New York. Now, let's take a look at some maps to show who populated New York State by 1855. These maps are coming out of an article called uh, Peopling the Post-Revolutionary New York Frontier 
from New York History by the New York Historical Association, which has several articles on this subject. So that's our reminder to look at journals and magazines that are published by historic and genealogical societies. Articles like these uh, containing studies of migra migrant populations will clue us into just where we might want to be looking for these families. So first here, we're considering New Yorkers themselves. And we're saying that Eastern New York here is the roughly 19 counties mostly filled in by the time of the revolution. And they've marked off that 1783 frontier here. Using statistics from the 1855 New York State Census, this is the first time we're given New York counties of birth. So based on those statistics, the rest of the dots here represent the percentage of people living beyond that frontier who were born in the Eastern New York counties. So essentially, two-fifths of those living upstate had been born in eastern New York. New Yorkers were the largest settlement group in three-quarters of upstate towns, and they tended to cluster. Going a step further, these census studies show us um, trends for specific eastern counties. For example, people born in Dutchess County tended to settle across the southern Finger Lakes, whereas those born in Montgomery County went to the extreme northwest corner of Jefferson County and to the southern portion of the Pulteney Purchase in Steuben County. Um, Dutchess County natives made up 11% of Yorkers in upstate, and they were the highest group from eastern New York. And then you'll recall that both of those counties had already been heavily settled by New Englanders. Now, here's that same map with New England settlers in New York. From the 1855 statistics, four in five of those who migrated to New York from a neighboring state were coming out of New England. So that's 47% of New York's population being made up of New Englanders. And by this time, most of them are coming out of Vermont with about 15%, uh, followed by Connecticut, Massachusetts at 12 to 13% each. And the New Englanders concentrated in three major areas, the North and the Northeast, and that's based on accessibility, so mostly Northern New Englanders settling there. The Hill Country, West and South of the Mohawk River, that, and the Chenango 20 townships I'm really talking about there, um, that's actually been called the most successful recreation of New England culture, and you're mostly getting Southern New Englanders there. And then we have to the West in the Holland Purchase, the Morris Reserve, um, those are all New Englanders settling over there. And these studies even let us break it down by state. We'll start with Connecticut, which overall throughout time sent the most settlers to New York of all of New England. Early on in the 1640s, of course, we had them settling on Long Island and then moving into Eastern tier like Dutchess and Westchester County. Um, and by a little later than that, we're also getting them pushing into Putnam and Orange County. After 1783, most Connecticut nutmeggers went on to the Chenango 20 townships. They made up over about half of all the pioneers over there. And they're also going to, after, um, by 1810 rather, they're going to be moving into other areas, including Genesee country, uh, where they primarily like to park themselves just south of Rochester. And then they're going to fill in some of the areas of the Holland Purchase as well. So by the 1850 census, a third of those born in Connecticut living outside of Connecticut were living in New York. And Connecticut natives made up at least 10% of the earliest, pop the earliest settlers in most of the frontier towns. And they were among pioneers for every frontier town in New York. Massachusetts migration numbers and routes and patterns of settlement, they were all similar to Connecticut. And of course, remember that many from Western Massachusetts were of Connecticut stock originally. So Massachusetts uh, natives can be found in every frontier town in New York as well. Uh, they're better represented in the West and North uh, portions and they're less prone to congregate. So you're not seeing as many where they're making up like a quarter of the pioneer population of any particular town. But they did congregate in the southern central area of that Boston 10 towns, which had been purchased uh, by those for those of the Berkshires, for example. And then also those Massachusetts reserved, where, which again, uh, Massachusetts had originally had the right to sell, so they were heavily advertised for that area. Uh, so by 1850 census, a quarter of those born in Massachusetts, but living outside of it, were in New York. 
Now I wanna take a moment to mention Maine because Massachusetts uh, included Maine for quite a while. But Mass Maine didn't make up over 10% of the population in any New York town, so they don't even have their own map. And the reason that they made up less than 1% of the New England population in New York is because they had their own frontier. Like Maine, Rhode Island didn't have large numbers migrating to New York, but that's more due to Rhode Island's own small population. Uh, they were still represented in all of these areas like the other New Englanders. And they were particularly uh, leaders in the Oneida County factories. Um, that's in the uh, Chenango 20 townships area and to the south of there. So in 1850, still about 30% of those born in Rhode Island are in New York. Now, New Hampshire only beat Rhode Island by a few thousand by 1855, uh, making up nearly 4% of the New England population in New York. Uh, and they only made up over 10% of the population in a handful of towns scattered out throughout the West. But mostly, New Hampshire went through Vermont on the way. So their natural choice is going to be in the far North country. And Vermont itself took the longest to cross the border because Vermont remained mostly unsettled until the revolution. Between then and the War of 1812, Vermont itself was one of the fastest growing states, but then it was hit in 1807 with economic trouble, some disease, unusually cold summers. So 1808 is when we start to see out migration surpassing in migration. And with that, the migration into the North Country becomes a flood and the area becomes nicknamed New Vermont. Now, Southern Vermont, it was still more direct sometimes to go through the Mohawk Gateway. And since they're coming later, a lot of that good land's already taken. Uh, so they're going to push all the way to the furthest part of the Holland Land Purchase, um, like on a Cotteraugus Creek between Erie and Cotteraugus County, where they made up of uh, like 30% of early settlers. So when we look at 1850 census, we have two fifths of those born in Vermont living in New York. That's one Vermonter in New York for every four in Vermont. So by this point, Vermont has the most, followed by Connecticut, Massachusetts. And um, I wanna take a look at two maps that can summarize what we've been talking about. So in this first map, I color coded the New England states and used their initials or names to indicate where they each had the highest concentration living in New York. So we see that Northern New York is dominated by Vermont with some New Hampshire, Massachusetts settlers reach up into St. Lawrence County, but then down through the center of New York in the midst of a huge swath of Connecticut nutmeggers with a small core of Rhode Islanders. And we have the Massachusetts group at the Boston 10 towns. And then we have all of New England represented in Western New York. And for the second map here, I've added color-coded arrows to indicate general migration streams. We have Massachusetts in red, populating the rest of Southern New England and Northern New England. Connecticut in purple goes north on the Connecticut River to help settle Western Massachusetts, and then south to cross Long Island Sound. We have the Northern counties in Connecticut being major settlers on the two sides of the Green Mountains. Uh, we have Eastern New Yorkers in light blue, filling in the area east of the Hudson River, even making their way up into Vermont. And finally, we have the major streams into and through New York in dark blue. So this is two centuries of history at one glance. However, then over 1 million ended up leaving New York for the West. New Englanders kept coming into New York, but they're passing through the state for new ones. And where were they going? The natural launching point was Ohio. The end of the Revolutionary War opened up the old Northwest. And we're gonna see New Englanders mostly choosing places where a Massachusetts group formed the Ohio Company of Associates. And they're going to the Southeast part of today's Ohio. Uh, Connecticut still had claims to the Western Reserve up in the Northeast part of Ohio. The US military set up district for bounty lands in central Ohio. And from there, we're gonna see New Englanders turn New Yorkers migrating further into the entire Northwest Territory. And they like to congregate with people of the same background, like Vermonters especially always prefer to settle with other New Englanders. So cluster research can really prove beneficial here. This 
geography lesson and historical overview was all part of researching ancestors who migrated into and across New York. Understanding that context helps us identify the locations in which we're most likely to find records that help identify or verify the migration path of a given family. Whenever we approach research, we have questions that need answering. In this case, we're looking for people in relation to places. And really this slide, it applies to tracking movements. By and large, the expanding of New York's frontier and the migrations into and across the state were tied to land. To start, we ask, where are the ancestors at any given time? We need to identify locations in order to track movements from one to the next. And to answer a question like that, we can make a timeline or spreadsheet uh, listing dates and places for each event and adding to that as we find new information. Once we have a list of locations, where exactly are they? Use maps, atlases, gazetteers, identify where each location is, see the trajectory once you have more than one location. To find the records for these places, we also need to understand those shifting borders and place names. And going hand in hand with that, once you know where you may find records, understand different levels of jurisdiction that created and kept them. Do some background work to figure out who made the records and where they were kept. Remember, you may find records at the local town level, county level, even more broadly at colony or state level. So the bottom line is doing background legwork can really make a difference, helping us find the kind of records that'll provide answers and clues as to the different places in which our ancestor lived. Okay, so in researching the potential New England origins of someone living in New York, start with what you know, especially geographically and historically speaking. Think about town names. Here in Chenango County, we have Norwich, New Berlin, Coventry, they're all named for Connecticut towns. Think about the region. This is the Chidango 20 townships where we already know many folks from Connecticut settled. Think about the time period. Of course, we have 1783 to 1820 is the mass migration period, but you can maybe even go further. In the southeast corner of this county, we have Bainbridge Township in particular. That area was in 1786, it was granted to Vermont sufferers, those who had supported New York in Vermont's drive for independence. And also think about surnames. We know this isn't guaranteed. Not everyone with the same surname is related and comes from the same place. But in this case, we have a township named for Nathaniel Green, who's a Quaker who came from Rhode Island. Uh, we have some early Norwich settlers who have recognizable New England names like Bowen, Shattuck, Sprague. Since the goal is to establish an ancestor in a specific place and time and work backwards to each former location, we need to look for records that help us track that ancestor and hopefully provide a birthplace so we know just where we're tracking back to. So we're going to start with the most direct and usually easiest to find sources. Most of us use the federal and state census records to track person's movements, and we can use what we learned from the census to look for a local history that might have more information. Uh, they often tell us where a settler came from or where descendants of a settler migrated away to. Uh, we may even be able to find a biography for these folks in either a local history like that or published genealogy. And we can look to verify the information we're given in those biogra biographies by using sources like death records, gravestones, obituaries. These end of life records can often feature data on the decedent's birthplace, if not further details of their life. Now, as we saw earlier, the studies about New England populations moving into New York come from the 1850 federal and 1855 New York state census records because they're the first to really show a person's birthplace. And of course, come 1880, we start seeing parents' birthplaces. So here's a quick example of finding New England origins using a federal census record for New York. So this is from Wyoming County, New York, the 1850 census. We're looking at the Willie or Wiley family. We see several children and their parents, Zachariah and Sarepta. And you'll notice that the mother is born in Connecticut. Her older children are born in Vermont. Now, fortunately, Vermont's vital records are easily searchable online. And the database on AmericanAncestors.org shows that these children were born at Paulette. Reviewing the history of that region of New York, Wyoming County was included in the lands of the Holland Land Company. 
And a source indicated that they had a Vermont office in the town of Danby, which just happens to neighbor Paulette. And furthermore, the parents uh, also married there in Paulette and their marriage index card in Vermont points us to Colchester, Connecticut, where Zachariah's father Asa is from, as well as an approximate year of his migration up to Vermont. So with the hints from the 1850 census, we can follow this family back to Vermont and even further back from there to Connecticut. Another way we can find birthplaces or former residences is to look at a person's endings to find their beginnings. Did they leave a death record, for example? Now in New York State, uh, mainly we're looking uh, to find, we're really only gonna see official death records post 1880, unless the person's death was recorded in one of the exception cities, like the boroughs of New York City, which we're looking at in this first example. Uh, we have poor little Mary Leach. She was born in Fall River, Massachusetts, but she died in Brooklyn at the age of one. So now we know that the family moved just within that one year. And also make sure to check for burial locations. In our other example here, we only see that Elizabeth was born in the US but we noticed that she was buried in Boston, Massachusetts. And we would go to the Boston birth records. We see her sons there giving their mother's birthplace in Livermore, Maine. Now, what about those who died before the 1880 New York State vital records or the 1850 census? Well, now we're hoping to find a gravestone or an obituary with some birthplace information. Uh, we're when we can search things like Fred Q. Bowman series of early New York newspapers. This is from the central um, issue of that. And we notice a Clark family from Lebanon, Connecticut with brothers Deodatus and Erastus who went to Oneida County. Their father, Dr. John Clark, was buried at Forest Hill Cemetery in Utica and his gravestone has his birthplace of Lebanon, Connecticut while his wife shows that she's from Wyndham, Connecticut. Now, secondary and compiled sources may also provide the origin information we're looking for, as well as filling in some of the migration story. Looking at annals of Oneida County, we see that Dr. John Clark and his wife remained in Lebanon until advanced age before moving in with their son Erastus, who was born at Lebanon, moved to Clinton in 1791, and then moved to Utica area in 1797. And we can follow back to learn more about this Clark family in the Clark genealogy from 1913. So we have an idea now of Dr. John Clark's lineage. Of course, without citations, we're going to need to verify this information. We can also look for published genealogies organized by location rather than just surname. American Ancestors offers several study projects along these lines, like the Settlers of the Beekman Patent series by Frank J. Doherty. It covers over 1,300 families who settled in the grant to Henry Beekman from 1697. That's the second largest patent in present day Dutchess County, New York. And many emigrants from New England lived in and passed through this patent on their way west. In addition to the books, as you can see, AmericanAncestors.org offers a searchable database. And the best part about a study project like this is that we can see some sources to follow to verify information. Now we know that researching in New York is rarely that simple. So what if our target person's origins were not given at their death? Since land was part of the appeal of relocating in the first place, we should definitely check land records to see if we can track purchases and sales made by the migrants. And we can check that movement from both directions. Once a person's relocated, they may give power of attorney to a relative or former neighbor to conduct business on their behalf back at their previous residence. And that's also true of collected payments for military pensions. The application and affidavits given to request a pension usually have at minimum the applicant's residence, but often more like birthplaces, prior residences, and anywhere where payments were sent or received. And the final record type we'll discuss, similar to those pension applications, is firsthand accounts. When the person migrating tells their own stories through diaries or travelogues in letters sent between friends and relatives. Land records are created at multiple jurisdictional levels. In researching former residences in New York, we want to concentrate on county level records those recorded by the county clerk. And that's great because they're usually the ones we're most familiar with and they have the easiest uh, access being digitized on familysearch.org. 
So the deeds recorded at the county level involve transactions between two individual parties. Now, the important thing for our migration research, not only are we putting a person in a specific time and place, but usually these county level deeds describe a person as being of a residence. So a grantee could be of a place in New England when they're first per purchasing land in New York, or a grantor might be described as of a new location when selling off property left behind. So with deeds, we can see when people moved into and out of areas by keeping track of the dates of purchases and sales in each location and checking residences listed for each grantor and grantee. Quickly, this example is from Ontario County in 1790, and we have multiple grantors and grantees being of multiple New England locations. And that's because we're looking at proprietors Nathaniel Gorham of Charlestown, Massachusetts, and Oliver Phelps of Suffield, Connecticut, selling lots in the Western Territory, ceded by Maine to Massachusetts, primarily to settlers from Northampton, Massachusetts. Now, sometimes a person still retains or inherits rights to lands in which they no longer live. In that case, they may give power of attorney to a proxy to handle their business in a location too distant to easily commute. Typically, you'll find these kinds of appointments and transactions right in the land records recorded by those county clerks. Uh, in the one example here, just be aware there might sometimes be a separate collection like this miscellaneous records of the Saratoga County Clerk available on FamilySearch.org. Um, but sometimes the grantor travels back or sends their permission back to the former home county to take care of the transaction. So you would see the new resident listed for the grantor. This is an example from the Berkshire County, Massachusetts deeds in which we have Knapp siblings giving their father uh, land that they inherited through their mother from their grandfather. And the siblings here include a brother from Litchfield, Connecticut, Litchfield County, Connecticut, two brothers in Onondaga County, New York, and their sister who stayed home in Massachusetts. So in this case, the siblings each appeared before a justice of the peace of their own county and state and had their signatures sent back to Berkshire County to be recorded. So remember to always be checking land records in all locations, each New York County and each New England jurisdiction in which the person lived. Information about residences can also be gleaned from military records if you're fortunate enough to have a veteran ancestor. Researching these migrations through that major wave of 1783 to 1820, we're mainly talking about veterans of the American Revolution or the War of 1812. And uh, we'll take a look at some uh, pension examples, but we won't have time to get to bounty lands today. Uh, typically, their records aren't quite as helpful for what we're trying to accomplish today. So let's focus on those military pensions. Some of the best accounts of migrations are given when a veteran or his widow apply for a military pension. The veteran or their widow lists the places of birth, marriage, enlistment, death, and residence. In this example, William McCuller claims that he enlisted at Westboro, Massachusetts, and when he first applies for a pension in 1818, he's living in Ira, Vermont. After he died, in 1839, his widow Chloe applies from her new home in St. Albans Township, Ohio. Now, often relatives and neighbors also provide attestations to verify what the uh, applicants are saying. In 1821, multiple neighbors from Ira, Vermont claimed to know that William was now of Salem, New York. Now, I first became interested in William McCuller because his pension example was used in the article Follow the Money from the Prologue magazine by National Archives. And the article focuses on less utilized collections commonly known as pension payment vouchers. They gave the residents of person the person who appeared to collect and appointments of any agent sent to collect on the pensioner's behalf. And William usually appointed someone to collect because the office in Burlington, Vermont was 78 miles from his home in Ira, Vermont and 96 miles from his home in Salem, New York. His pension file also included power of attorney assignments for collection. In this example from 1826, He's living in Salem in Washington County, New York, giving power of attorney back to a resident of Burlington, Vermont. Now, if you're interested in learning what your ancestor's journey was like, personal diaries and letters are fantastic resources. Even if you don't find one for your specific ancestor, you can maybe find a diary written by someone who made the similar trek 
like over the same time period, maybe even following the same routes, just to get a sense of daily life, hardship, moments of celebration. This particular example is the diary of a nine-year-old girl from Boston who in 1836 took a trip through Western Massachusetts to New York. And she's writing about taking a boat through Troy to Albany, where after dinner, they took a walk to see the city. But she writes, we saw a great many pigs in the streets. Resources for finding this kind of record include AmericanAncestors.org, where this diary is in the digital library and archives. Or you can check the NEHDS library catalog, library.nehds.org, where you'll find entries for all of our published collections, as well as manuscript materials. And also use ArchiveGrid, which allows you to search archives, historical societies, and libraries across the country. And don't forget to check the original location rather than just the final destination. After all, those likeliest to have kept a letter detailing a migration would be the relative or friend that the migrant is writing to back home. Here's one such letter held at the Connecticut Historical Society. We have Ira Gridley of Whitesboro, New York, writing back to his parents in Farmington, Connecticut in 1830. He travels to Western New York looking for work. When the offer at Troy wasn't good enough, he went to Utica writing, I took the boats the distance of 103 miles. He tallied his cost for passage, lodging, victuals, but alas, he writes, I went to look for work I went all over Utica almost and could find none to suit me. So he left Utica without a destination and took the canal path on foot to Whitesboro where he liked an offer. So we've got a path, method of transportation, motivations with finding work. And he even name drops those he knows who try to help him along the way. So even if you don't find your target ancestors firsthand account, track down a similar story to fill in those gaps. Now, of course, we have many more record types and research techniques that we can employ when researching New Englanders who moved into and through New York. And I'll leave you with just a few suggestions for meeting the challenges we face in researching migrating ancestors. Be thorough. The more records you read and add to your timeline, the more complete an understanding you will have of a person or family's movements. And that can also help you in differentiating between two folks of the same name. And especially when we have trouble identifying our target person in a place, we need to broaden our scope. Research their family, associates, neighbors. As illustrated here, there are often circles of people associated with your target family member. Many New Englanders settled in places where they already knew people, chain migration. Through these contacts, new, new immigrants could settle into pre-established communities where they could find job opportunities, support. So tracking people with ties to the target may allow us to find records with the sought after answers and clues as to where that New York resident came from in New England. And we want to research at both ends, be thorough in every location. The work doesn't stop when we identify a potential place of origin. We really need to research the family in that place to make sure that we have the right person and to be able to trace them further back. When researching those who migrated from New England to and through New York, keep in mind two major methods. One, consider the historical and geographical context in settlement and migration patterns. Two, use a variety of records and cluster research at each location to fully track your ancestors' movements. In other words, we need to be as determined as our migrating ancestors and keep digging to find those Yankee Yorkers. So I'll leave you today with just a reminder that the handout, the syllabus that we've put together contains a long list of helpful resources. NEHDS has access to all of them, along with online guides and books for sale that focus on what we do best, tracking the New Englanders as they leave for New York. Well, thank you so much, Kyle. Um, before we get to your questions, I do want to tell you about a few upcoming programs and other educational opportunities. So starting at the end of this month, we'll be offering a four-week online course on New York City research. 
looking at the genealogical research records and strategies one century at a time. And if you'd like to learn more about researching migrating ancestors, you can purchase our on-demand course, Tracing Ancestors on the Move in America, available for sale until the end of February. But you have, uh, once you purchase it, you have access to all of the materials, the recordings, the handouts, the slides for the foreseeable future. And finally, if you'd like to get more hands-on help and do some on-the-ground research for your upstate New York ancestors, join us in May as we lead a research tour to the, to the New York State Library and Archives in Albany. And you can learn more about all of these programs and upcoming events at AmericanAncestors.org slash events. All right, so let's get to some questions. If you'd like to ask something of Kyle, go ahead and type it into the Q&A panel. Um, so one person asks, could you please um, clarify a bit about the military track. You mentioned the military track. Why is it called a mili military track? What is it? The military track in New York was originally intended to be for veterans. It's a bounty land area. Uh, now, in New York, the situation became a little complicated as to getting the rights to give away that land and land speculators getting in the way. So not a lot of veterans actually were able to settle on the lands that they had rights to. But it is called the military tract because it was intended for military veterans. And kind of the, the same thing when we're talking about Ohio, I had shown there's a military tract in Ohio. That was the federal rather than the New York government giving bounty lands to veterans. Uh, now, several people have asked, you know, specifically, why did my ancestor from point A end up in point B in New York. I mean, you talked some uh, about, you know, some general motivations. Um, what would be your go-to source for, to really kind of try to understand um, maybe where these people are coming from and why they're moving to a very specific place in New York? Well, there are some great resources that provide a lot of examples that we just didn't have time to get to today. And your specific pathway from point A to point B may be among them. Uh, starting with, I would definitely start with Matthew's expansion of New England, but then there's also a couple of sources that are from the New York perspective, um, Yankees and Yorkers, for example, and these are sources that I've listed on the handout if you need a full citation to be able to find those. Um, and you, obviously we were focusing on um, you know, kind of early migrations. Uh, if, as we see, a few people were asking too about, you know, Irish immigrants, if they're coming um, into New England and then going into New York, I mean, are there any kind of generalizations to talk about um, other immigrant populations that are coming in through New England and maybe ending up in central or western New York? Uh, that really wasn't my focus with this. I was really looking more at the earlier time period and the English colonists, the New England from England kind of colonists. But I'm sure there are resources out there. You can start with the ones that I've listed on the handout and expand out from there to, to get the answers that you're looking for. But I really can't speak to it right now. Um, and a few people are asking where to find the, the syllabus. So the syllabus is a purchasable uh, download. Uh, it's a PDF that you can purchase on our online bookstore. Um, there's a link to it in your reminder email, and we'll also include a link uh, to, the, to the syllabus in our follow-up email as well. So um, lots of great information there. And of course, if you don't want to purchase it or if you miss something, maybe you tuned in late, um, this presentation has been recorded and it will also be posted to our YouTube channel and our website. So again, you can pause, rewind, um, take uh, copious amounts of notes. Um, so that's always available to you for free as well. Um, we also have several questions about, you know, so my ancestor moved to New York and then they went off to Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, Ontario. Mm -hmm. um, what tips do you have for, you know, kind of where they go next? I mean, again, do you recommend looking at both ends? So if they end up in Ohio, doing research there and doing research in New York? Absolutely. The same methodology that we talked about in New York needs to be applied wherever you're talking about. So if a census record indicates an area outside of New York, starting with Ohio, because that tended to be the launching point, as I mentioned, uh, find that location and do a little background digging to find out how they recorded 
uh, information. So land records, again, are going to be a big one if, if you're lucky enough to have folks who uh, obtained land in some form or another. But definitely work both ends. So wherever your census record or other research, because we like to start from the present and work backwards, you're really going to have to dig into each and every location and try to do the same things that we would do in New York to find New Englanders to get back to New York in the first place. Um, just a few more questions before wrapping up. Marianne asks if you know of any Y DNA projects for New Englanders who travel to or through New York. Is uh, anything on your radar? It isn't on my radar. Mostly when I do DNA work, it's surname based. But that may be something to ask around to my colleagues. And if we get an answer, we can put it out there into the universe. Uh, but it's not something that I've used to be a geographic uh, study like that, but more surname based. And that's where your cluster research could come in handy. Uh, now, Jim asks, and I and maybe you know an answer or you can <laughs> provide an answer. But why are uh, why are early New York records so awful when New England <laughs> records are so rich? It comes down to who's in charge of creating the records in the first place. So a lot of the times what you have in New England is town level uh, jurisdictions and they have different ideas of what's helpful to keep records of uh, New York was just a different ball game. And again, you also had the fact that it was New Netherlands before it was New York. And then you had all those border issues happening. And New York really was the frontier. It wasn't as settled. Like if you think of Massachusetts Bay, that really became uh, very settled very quickly in comparison. Um, there was also a question about the land companies and those records. Are, are Where do you find those records? Are they easily accessible? For the most part, they are pretty easily accessible. By and large, uh, you can find them at the county clerk level when you're looking for an ancestor who's getting land from one of those uh, proprietors. Uh, like I showed the Phelps and Gorham uh, example that was from a county clerk level, county level deed. The exception to this is going to be the Holland purchase, the Holland Land Company records, but they're kept in a lot of places, and they're even being digitized like on familysearch.org. There are some fantastic indexes to those records that were created by Karen Livesey, and they have also been digitized on Ancestry. You will need to figure out the key to understand them, but then you can track down the records. Uh, those records are a little bit different in the way that they're set up because it's a kind of a payment plan system. So they're not as easy to find origins through them, but it could be possible. And it could also be a cluster research situation where you can see a group migrating. Like when I gave you the example from Paulet and Danby, there was a big group of Quakers from Danby who moved to Wyoming County in that Holland Land Company area. So that, that may be a way of thinking about those things. But yes, most of those big land purchases had uh, pretty thorough records and they're pretty easily accessible. All right. Well, thanks again, Kyle. And I know that there were several questions that we weren't able to get to, um, some some specific questions, some more general questions. Um, but unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for today. But if you do have more specific questions about your family history research, you can consider hiring our research services team or you can use our chat service. Our chat service is free. It's open to the public um, Tuesday through Saturday, 9 to 5 Eastern time with extended hours on Wednesdays, 9 to 8 p.m. Eastern time. Um, so if you have a, a reference question, maybe you're trying to figure out if a certain record exists or where to look, um, or maybe there's some hard to read handwriting that you'd like some help with. You can use our free service, um, be put in touch directly with a genealogist on, uh, on our staff. And to access that, you just go to AmericanAncestors.org slash chat. 
So thank you again for joining us. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American Ancestors to keep these programs free and to create other programs for you and others. If you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center at AmericanAncestors.org. Best of luck in your research, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.